What is it like to dissociate? Dissociation is notoriously difficult to explain. In fact, one of the most common words that people use to describe the experience is indescribable. Even many trained psychiatrists and psychologists struggle to define the word. Because only 20% of people have had the experience of dissociating, it can be hard for the other 80% to imagine what it might feel like. But understanding dissociation could hardly be more important, and not just from an academic perspective. Dissociation is closely linked to trauma and may contain important clues about not only how we respond to adversity, but also how we might heal from it. One of the largest barriers to understanding dissociation is that it is actually three different things going on at once. First, there is a subjective experience of dissociating, which usually takes the form of depersonalization and derealization, or a feeling that someone has become separated from their sense of self or reality. Second, there are other features that can best be described as hypnotic phenomena, including being absorbed in one's thoughts, acting automatically rather than intentionally, and being highly suggestible to outside influences. And finally, there are the distortions in memory, including both an inability to retrieve existing memories and a tendency to remember things that have not actually happened. Those three things form the standard textbook definition of dissociation, but after having heard that, do you feel any closer to actually understanding what the experience is like? Probably not. Depersonalization, derealization, hypnotic phenomena, memory lapses, these are all abstract terms that can be hard to wrap our heads around. Let's try to instead ground these words using a concrete example. Imagine you are heading home when suddenly someone robs you at gunpoint. This is one of the scariest moments of your life and even after it's over, you cannot shake it. In the coming weeks, you start to notice things you've never experienced before. You start to dissociate. You have moments where you look at your body and think, I'm not myself or look in the mirror and say to yourself, that isn't me. You begin to wonder if your experience of the world is real, or if it is instead illusory or fake, like a dream you can't wake up from. These experiences of depersonalization and derealization are often disconcerting, or even outright frightening to the point of inducing panic. While they are by far the most striking of the new experiences you've had since the trauma, they don't tell the whole story. There are other things happening as well. You have also started to notice instances when you become so lost in your own thoughts that you have completely ignored everything else going on around you. You have times when you drive home and realize upon getting to the door that you were so absorbed in thinking about the robbery that you weren't paying any attention to your surroundings and have no memory of the drive itself. Instead, your driving was done automatically, almost as if on autopilot, with no conscious awareness or effort on your part. You've also noticed that you are less trusting of your own instincts and are more inclined to accept the ideas and suggestions of others. When being questioned by police after the robbery, for example, you were initially quite certain about what happened, but as the conversation continued, you started to become unsure. While you originally knew that there was only one robber, when the police start asking about multiple perpetrators, you begin to question your own memory. Were there two? Three? More even? This suggested idea has now become mixed with your memories of reality, making it harder than ever to say with certainty what you know to be true. This brings us to the third thing you've noticed since the robbery, strange and inexplicable distortions of memory. When you think about things that happened around the time of the robbery, such as the friends you saw for dinner that week or the book you were reading around that time, these details often feel hazy, blurry, or indistinct and in some instances you find yourself unable to retrieve these memories at all. This contrasts with your memories of the robbery itself, which are extremely vivid and occur as sudden intrusions of sights and sounds. These flashbulb memories are so intense that they can even feel indistinguishable from reality in the moments when they occur. These intrusive memories are not always accurate, however. Sometimes the image that shows up is of a place you've never been, or at a completely different time of day, showing you a version of events that is at odds with what you know actually happened. These alterations in memory are disconcerting and further erode your sense of reality. You feel frightened and confused, as if you're walking on shifting sand. You are, in a word, dissociating. The way you're feeling now, after having gone through this imagined experience, 
has put you closer to an understanding of the things that define dissociation and hopefully increased your ability to empathize with people who have experienced this. But this new level of insight also introduces new questions. Why are these three things linked? Why do people who experience depersonalization and derealization also show hypnotic phenomena and distortions in memory? What could possibly tie these three seemingly random things together? Research suggests that the answer to this question may lie in a far more universal human experience. The answer may, in fact, be found in our dreams. While this may sound mystical, outlandish, or unscientific, let's think about it logically. When you dream, what are you doing? What are you experiencing? Dreams are a place where imagination runs wild, where your mind constructs entirely new realities from scratch, making up places and situations that don't always have parallels in the real world. Memories of dreams are slippery, with most dreams being forgotten within a few minutes of waking up. However, a few of these made-up memories do end up embedding themselves into long-term storage. Those two patterns, a tendency both to forget things easily and to remember things that didn't happen, exactly mimic the memory abnormalities seen in dissociation. Dreaming also explains the feelings of unreality seen in dissociative states. Occasionally, while you're dreaming, you may become consciously aware of the fact a phenomenon known as lucid dreaming. During a lucid dream, you often have a distinct feeling that you are not yourself and that things around you don't feel real. This sensation of things being separated from reality directly mirrors the depersonalization and derealization that happens in a state of dissociation. What about the hypnotic phenomena? The ideas that come from our dreams are often capable of sticking with us and changing our minds more easily than if we had encountered them in waking life echoing the suggestibility seen in dissociation. We also see a shared automaticity in how we navigate these worlds. In dreams, we often observe ourselves acting without our conscious input, feeling more like passengers in our bodies rather than the captain of the ship. And what is dreaming, if not the ultimate form of mental absorption, where you are so entranced by what is happening inside your own mind that you are utterly unconscious of the world around you? If all aspects of dissociation have direct parallels in dreaming, then it's not unreasonable to conclude that there may be a link between the two. Indeed, scientific research does suggest that dissociative experiences seem to be caused by a sudden intrusion of the dreaming state into waking life, creating a sort of halfway point between dreaming and wakefulness, in which your brain is conscious and aware as if you were awake, but also generates feelings of unreality, memory lapses, and hypnotic phenomena as if you were dreaming. Differences between people who dissociate and those who don't have even been observed on electroencephalography, suggesting that this link is not merely theoretical. The involvement of dreamlike consciousness in the underlying physiology of dissociation also explains why these experiences are much more common around the time of trauma. The stress of a traumatic experience directly impairs one's ability to get quality sleep. This sleeplessness then leads to dissociative experiences with even a single night of missed sleep having been shown to cause an increase in the tendency to dissociate. However, that is just the first domino to fall, as sleeplessness continues to impact the brain, setting off a chain reaction. While sleep deprivation generally impairs the formation of long-term memories, it also makes people more likely to store memories as strong but isolated sensory fragments, the flashbulb memory pattern we talked about earlier. Sleep deprivation also promotes the storing of negative memories over positive ones through the hippocampus and intensifies the threat response of the amygdala to new stimuli. In this way, a traumatic event lays the groundwork not only for past memories to recur over and over, but also for future events to be perceived more negatively, turning a one-time event into an ongoing nightmare. So what can we do about this? Knowing that sleep, trauma, and dissociation are linked like this can help not only to increase our empathy for people who have dissociative disorders, but also to potentially identify targets for treatment. A number of studies have shown that sleep-focused therapies can significantly reduce both dissociative and trauma-related symptoms like nightmares, and reassuringly, these can even be delivered at the same time as more traditional trauma-focused therapies. More studies are needed, but the early signs are promising. Ultimately, these links between dissociation, trauma, and dreaming reveal something more than just a path to treatment. They help us to reframe how we think about the experience of dissociation entirely, 
by suggesting that dissociation is not an aberration, a glitch, or a disease. While we typically view dissociation through a clinical lens, the underlying mechanisms, including the capacity for deep mental absorption, the ability to generate vivid imagery, and the capacity to be changed to our core by an idea, are arguably the exact opposite of pathology. These are the same traits that fuel the creation of great art, of spellbinding stories, and of boundless creativity. They allow us to envision worlds that do not yet exist, with all the good and ill that can come from that. Even if not everyone dissociates, understanding dissociation can nevertheless help to illuminate the very things that make us most human. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it helped you to gain valuable insights into a complex and poorly understood part of our minds. If you want to learn more about dissociation or other psychiatric conditions, please consider getting my books on Amazon or checking out my other videos on this channel. In the meantime, please know that I wish you all the best for the rest of your day.